Hello, my name is Kelly Sims Gallagher, and I'm delighted to welcome you to a special presentation featuring updates from five of the Fletcher School's research centers. I'm a professor of energy and environmental policy, and I'm also Fletcher's academic dean. So I'll be your host guiding you through the next few minutes. We will hear from the Center for International Environment and Resource Policy, otherwise known as CIRP, the Center for Strategic Studies, the Institute for Business in the Global Context, the Ferris Center for Eastern and Mediterranean Studies, and the Henry J. Lear Institute. Among my many hats at Fletcher, I'm director of the Climate Policy Lab and co-director of CIRP, the center in which the Climate Policy Lab is based. So I'm gonna put on my CIRP hat right now and join co-director Jenny Aker to share our updates from a busy year. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Kelly, nice to see you. Um, hi, everybody, my name is Jenny Aker. Uh, among my many hats, I am also the co-director of CIRP along with Kelly Sims Gallagher. And I'm also a professor of development economics here at the Fletcher School. Um, we're really proud to share everything that we've accomplished at CIRP this year. So I'm gonna let Kelly take it off and start off with a little bit of our fundraising. So this year, CIRP has been awarded $1.64 million in new grant sponsored research, $76,000 in research dedicated gifts, 25,000 in contracted professional services and over 5,000 in student focused gifts. It's definitely been a very busy year. It's also been really busy for our students as well. CIRP has supported about 46 student employees as both research and teaching assistants, and we're going to continue to support a number of students as research assistants in their internships over the course of this summer. If we look at our graduating class, we have about 123 graduating students who have taken at least one IERP course, and 27 of them have taken at least three courses. We've also had 26 students completing their thesis or their capstone that are being advised by um, faculty in the IERP field. Another thing we did this year is that uh, CIRP and the Climate Policy Lab have connected with alums through our Community Voices blog, which is a new blog we introduced this year. Current students interviewed Black alums for Black History Month and AAPI alums for Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And we expect to continue this series for other upcoming commemorative months. CIRP has also partnered with Woodwell Climate Research Center this year, um, with Woodwell hiring two Fletcher student interns and partnering with the Climate Policy Lab and the Lear Institute on a project investigating the impacts of climate change on Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And closer to home, the MBTA solicited the expertise of Professor Barbara Cates Garnick and her students on offshore wind development research. One of the things I'm most proud of is um, our policy impact. And I'd like to mention three highlights from the Climate Policy Lab, which I direct. Um, first, the Climate Policy Lab was pivotal in resurrecting mission innovation, a joint effort of more than 20 nations through our policy briefings, media engagement, and a key publication in Nature Energy. Um, second, we learned that the, the database on US energy RD&D investments that I produce annually with Laura Diaz Anadon at the University of Cambridge has been used by the International Energy Agency in reporting on US data. And finally, I served on the advisor committee for the Massachusetts Decarbonization Roadmap with Governor Baker since committing to a net zero target for 2050. The Climate Policy Lab also uh, was engaged in a number of track two dialogues on climate change uh, between the United States and Europe, China, India, and more. Um, and we've continued our work on country case studies on the, over on the effects of overseas Chinese financing on renewable energy and coal. And in the next year, we plan to scale up our policy gap analysis um, beyond our original three countries of China, India, and Ethiopia to an additional seven. Over to you, Jenny. Yeah, beyond those things, we're also collaborating with the Friedman School of Nutrition, um, the Woodwell Climate Research Center, and the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water in New Delhi to look at the impacts of community-based natural farming on carbon sequestration, income, productivity, and resilience, focusing on India. That links up a lot with some of the research that I also do in Sub-Saharan Africa, looking at the adoption of a number of different environmental technologies and how that's affecting communities' resilience to climate change and how that's also affecting their income and their yields. 
That's coupled with some projects that we're doing looking at a different type of technology, the mobile phone, and seeing how mobile phones can be useful in terms of improving adults and children's ability to learn faster, as well as getting hands into those who need it, getting money into the hands of those who need it the most by using mobile money. We've done a lot of that by working with governments, the private sector and NGOs, and similar to much of Kelly's work, we've been working directly with policymakers as collaborators, but also attempting to influence policy in this space. Well, Jenny, you had some terrific new publications this year, um, and uh, we also had a number of new publications in the Climate Policy Lab, and I wanted to specifically mention uh, the new book by our, our new research professor and CPL Managing Director, Amy Myers Jaffe, on energy's digital future, harnessing innovation for American resilience and national security. Beyond publications, we hosted many virtual events this year, including webinars about our research articles, a debrief on President Biden's Lead Climate Leader Summit, uh, together with Dean Kite, uh, and a wonderful panel on women's leadership in clean energy with Amy Myers Jaffe and Barbara Cates Garnick. Yeah, and I think a lot of those online events, even though we're missing kind of being together, the positive thing about them is that it's really allowed us to expand our outreach. And, you know, despite the fact that we've mainly been operating in a remote environment, both for teaching and for research, all of our researchers and our centers across Fletcher have really worked hard to advance our research this year, um, despite kind of a lot of these challenges that are going on worldwide. Absolutely. So let's turn to our next center and up next is Monica Toft, Professor of International Politics and Director of the Center for Strategic Studies. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I don't know where you're sitting right now watching this presentation. Uh, I'm the director of the Center for Strategic Studies at the Fletcher School. My name is Monica Duffy Toft. I'm also a professor of international politics, and I'm delighted to share with you some of the research that we're doing at the center, and actually that we've been doing for the last three years. And what it is, is the Military Intervention Project. And so I'm quickly gonna go through what it is, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it. So what are we doing? So what we're doing is creating a database of all US military interventions since the country's founding, since 1776. Uh, and we're including not only sort of overt displays of the use of force, war and violence, but also the threat of the use of force. And in cases where the United States gets involved with an adversary, where the United States may choose to do nothing, to back down. Uh, we also have covert operations in there to the best that we can. You know, there's, many of them are classified, but a good number are no longer. Uh, and we also include drone strikes, as well as the costs, uh, both the direct costs, but then the unintended consequences and you can think about the second and third order effects of these interventions over time. We've included 200 plus different variables or factors uh, driving these uh, interventions and the consequences of them. And what's really critical for us uh, producing this as a public good is that we have case histories and narratives for every case with multiple resources and sourcing uh, to help people who want to uh, follow up on these cases um, uh, to do research later on. So the basic research question that is guiding it is what are the costs and or benefits of America's increasing reliance on its military power uh, uh, as a foreign policy choice? And here we're at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, uh, and it appears from our data and what started us you know, researching this is that the United States is turning to the use of force much more readily uh, than let's say diplomacy or trade and sanctions. Uh, and so I put forward this hypothesis about kinetic diplomacy, meaning that the United United States is using the use of force or the threat of the use of force as a way to sort of regulate its behavior in the international system uh, and overriding sort of diplomacy and other tools that we might use, including, of course, economic. Uh, and then we're looking at the domestic and international consequences of this U.S. military involvement, both over time since 1776 and over space. So why are we doing this? Why do we have the Military Intervention Project? Well, if you think about the United States historically, it, it's across different periods, it's tended to have strategic goals. Uh, and one of the big questions we have, you can see the last word is today, um, is what is U.S. national strategic goals? So in the earlier periods, it was independence from, the, from Great Britain, then it was conquering the great frontier, 
and we include the frontier wars in our uh, data set, then it was sort of becoming involved globally, globally uh, to end the to to help end the war of all wars, which was World War One, uh, and then World War Two, getting involved in sort of helping to defeat the Axis powers, and then with the Cold War after World War II, uh, preventing World War Three, in particular a nuclear holocaust, and then when the Soviet Union declined, the United States was committed to leading a new world order uh, through the '90s and 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 then into the 2000s until 2001, uh, when the, it shifted to defeating the global war on terrorism. And we've done that fairly handily. I mean, there's still ISIS and Al-Qaeda elements and other jihadists active, but generally speaking, we have succeeded there. And so the big question is, what is U.S. strategic uh, goals today and how to best achieve that? And so one of the arguments we're making is that the United States has one hammer, but many nails. And our policy has reverted to sort of a security whack-a-mole policy. That's that game at circuses where you whack uh, a mole. Uh, and we seem to have become addicted to intervention. And, and this is a notepad from John Bolton, former national security advisor uh, to former President Trump. And the idea here was you know, dealing with Colombia and he wants to send 5,000 troops uh, to Venezuela, but he wants to send 5,000 troops to neighboring uh, Colombia to deal with the crisis in Venezuela. And again, the idea here is, okay, rather than resort to diplomacy or think about economic trade and sanctions, uh, we need to send troops. So if you, and, and we, we don't think this is working, uh, domestically in the United States, uh, most Americans now are less satisfied with the position of the U.S. in a period where, more, where we are more actively engaged. And if you look at our power and influence around the world, more uh, citizens around the world see the United States as a major threat uh, than they did uh, just you know, uh, 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 in 2013, uh, and this is to 2017. So, you know, we're, we're sort of tacking and tracking uh, how the U.S. has sort of devolved into a bully, right? And, and a bully is somebody who goes after those that it, he or she perceives as vulnerable. And in this case, the United States is tending to go after smaller powers. Uh, moreover, if you look at the, the, the state of the State Department, uh, there's been a rise of political appointees in the Department of State, and diplomacy has been sort of given short shrift. Uh, and as a result, what's happened is, is that we've seen a rise, and not only a rise in the number of, of military interventions around the world, but the intensity of them. So we think this is imperative to do this kind of work. So basically, the approach is to create a synthesis of the entire arc of U.S. foreign policy and its intervention theory, and to, pre and to present that across the different era eras to show how the U.S. has, has changed. Um, and, and what we're doing is, is we're looking at historical narratives and personalities across the different periods doing sort of a grand strategic analysis, what I just ran through from the inception of the nation to today, um, and trying to figure out uh, what is the proper balance between use of force. We're not, we're not saying that use of force is always over the, off the table, but it just shouldn't be on the table as much. And then thinking through diplomacy, trade, and soft and hard power skills. Um, and again, sort of countering the argument or examining the argument that the U.S. is a bully uh, and that the reason for why uh, domestically and internationally, it's, it, is it due to this over-reliance on, on force and minimal support to, for diplomatic efforts uh, and the idea that we don't have a grand national strategy and that we're not debating it as a nation. So how are we doing this? Uh, and this is my last slide. How we're doing this is I've pulled together a team of about 30 scholars, including masters of law and diplomacy students, uh, master students in other programs, as well as postdoctoral fellows uh, and myself um, and a research director. And uh, for the last three years, we've been compiling this data set. And the good news is the data set is now done, uh, the first iteration. Uh, and we have a book coming out with Oxford University Press and a series of articles I've published in other venues and opinion editorials. Uh, and so the data set is done and now we're, we're, we're getting the work published and thinking through how to best influence policy because we think U.S. foreign policy could be improved and that it should be improved so that the United States uh, is not seen as a bully internationally and that it can have a better, more strategic uh, uh, foreign policy and national security policy to better secure U.S. strategic interests. So thanks for joining me and I look forward to meeting you in person uh, if you come to the Fletcher School. Thank you, Professor Toft. Uh, the next group has thrived in our virtual environment, pursuing and publishing work relevant to this precise moment. Please welcome Bhaskar Chakravarti, Dean of the 
of Global Business and Director of the Institute for Business in the Global Context. Hello, I'm Bhaskar Chakraborty. I'm the Dean of Global Business at the Fletcher School. I'm also the Director of the Institute for Business in the Global Context. The Institute uh, is predicated on uh, the notion of connecting the world of business with the world. And I wanted to share with you uh, some really exciting research that we've been doing on the digital economy. And this digital economy, as we all know, has been the stand-in for the real economy uh, for uh, most of us or all of us over the course of the last 12 months. Uh, we've been uh, working on a, a set of issues that uh, we put underneath the label of IDEA imagining a digital economy for all. Now, where we started with this idea is that over the course of the first uh, eight weeks of the lockdown in 2020, uh, our embrace of digital technologies have advanced by at least five years, if not more. And practically all aspects of our lives have gone online. Our uh, children's education has gone online. Healthcare for many of us has gone online. Economic transactions have gone online. Retail has gone online. For many of us staying connected uh, with friends or uh, those who are in the dating market, uh, dating has gone online, which is kind of surprising given that we are all supposed to be socially distanced. But dating apps have uh, surged over the course of the last uh, 12 months. Sadly, saying goodbye to uh, near and dear ones who have succumbed to COVID has also gone online because we could not meet them uh, or see them in their final hours. Now, my research team and I often think of ourselves as those medieval map makers who were trying to figure out the contours of a planet that they still hadn't completely navigated and trying to figure out where the land masses were, uh, where the waters are, where the mountains are, where the dragons are. And uh, we are map makers of the digital planet. And uh, specifically, uh, we uh, study 90 countries around the world and try to understand how these countries are making a journey from a physical past to a digital future. And in the context of uh, making uh, uh, that journey, uh, we also try to understand how digital evolution and digital advancement may have played a role in uh, whether the country uh, was economically resilient uh, or socially resilient uh, during the time of COVID. So here is a map which uh, helps us uh, see that, those connections in an interesting way. On uh, the vertical axis, I have a measure of economic resilience in the first half of the first quarter of 2020. And uh, the horizontal axis is uh, the measure of digital evolution uh, of countries. And what we find is that countries that are more digitally evolved in general, have tended to be more economically resilient uh, over uh, the course of the pandemic-induced lockdowns. And uh, also, uh, we see that uh, many of the countries uh, uh, at the bottom half of the graph are also the ones that uh, uh, maintained a high degree of social distancing. Those darkness of the dots uh, represent a very high degree of social distancing. And the more socially distanced uh, uh, the economy was, uh, the less resilient uh, they ended up being. So it's very interesting to see the connections between how we use technology uh, during the pandemic. Now, it's also interesting to make some comparisons uh, across countries. So here we have the United Kingdom and Ireland, uh, which are roughly uh, at the same level of digital evolution, but their level of economic resilience was quite different. And a question is why? Well, it turns out that the United Kingdom, a significant part of their economy is based on face-to-face -face services, whether it is going to the theater or to restaurants or people coming through Heathrow Airport and uh, transitioning from one part of the world to another. And much of the UK economy was reliant on that kind of traffic, which of course went down. For the case of Ireland, much of their economy was already digital. So uh, maintaining that digital presence, uh, you know, just uh, uh, allowed them to remain economically resilient over the course of 2020. Another interesting comparison is between the United States and uh, South Korea. Uh, so if you think about both United States and South Korea, both highly evolved, uh, digitally evolved countries. But as you can see, the United States is uh, sort of that light purple and the South Korea is the tiny red dot. And the two countries took very different approaches to how they use technology uh, over the course of the pandemic. In South Korea, in fact, that 
extreme level of digital evolution was used uh, to give South Koreans real-time information on their COVID exposure status by integrating data from many different sources, cell phones, credit card information, uh, CCTV cameras on street corners. And that was used to give people a sense of whether they were going to be exposed to uh, uh, infection or not. And uh, with that knowledge, South Koreans managed to sort of stay uh, reasonably close to their pre-pandemic uh, forms of activity. And uh, the United States uh, had to you know, go into a, a, almost an inconsistent series of lockdowns uh, over, the course of, uh, over the course of the 12 months. So the two countries took very different approaches in terms of how they uh, dealt with the pandemic and how they used technology in order to uh, maintain economic activity. As we looked at how social media uh, was used uh, across uh, the world, we saw some really interesting patterns. We saw how sentiments of uh, social media posts varied over the course of the first six months of 2020. What I have here in this really complicated graph is a series of sentiments uh, that we distilled from uh, the thousands and thousands of social media posts coming out of the United States. And uh, that blue graph uh, is a measure of sadness. A lot of sad sentiments uh, dominated the graph. Uh, happiness is the red uh, graph, which tends to uh, stay under, uh, you know, towards the bottom. And then the other uh, one that we, uh, uh, that we saw, uh, you know, being, uh, playing a predominant role is disgust. Uh, we saw a lot of disgust, uh, and uh, and of course the other sentiments that are here are anger and surprise. It's very interesting to compare uh, uh, these uh, sentiments uh, in the United States with other countries such as South Africa, South Korea, India, New Zealand. It turns out that most of those countries tended to stay relatively happier than the United States, at least as far as social media sentiments were concerned uh, during uh, the lockdown. Really interesting, and one question is perhaps uh, people were going through an extremely uh, stressful period uh, because of uh, the pandemic, because of uh, the economic job losses and the humanitarian crises that we were all facing. And social media became an outlet uh, for exchanging uh, news and stories uh, that were, uh, to some extent, were lifting people's spirits a little bit. And we saw that playing out in uh, different parts of the world. Uh, much more so than in the United States. Another factor that we uh, took some time to study is what was the state of trust in these digital ecosystems? And what we found is that digital trust is not monolithic. It depends on whether you think about trust in the ecosystem, trust in the environment and the experience, or trust in terms of the, uh, the, the behaviors uh, that users show, or trust in terms of a response to a survey question. And the answers to these questions are very different. Uh, the Netherlands ranked number one in terms of answers to survey questions. People generally said that they trusted uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the ecosystem. However, in terms of behaviors, the Netherlands scored really low in terms of trust, trusting behaviors. Similarly, Switzerland ranked very high in terms of how trustworthy uh, the digital eco, uh, ecosystem and environment is. However, the behaviors uh, were relatively low. Another facet of trust is uh, that we found that a highly digitally evolved and stable uh, uh, economy uh, in, in, uh, also uh, tended to have a more trustworthy environment. Uh, another interesting uh, paradox was that both mature and stable digital economies and less mature and fast growing digital economies both of them engendered trust. And finally, a combination of highly evolved and uh, high momentum uh, digital economies, economies that were uh, not only advanced, but also moving very, very quickly, engendered a high degree of trust among users. Finally, I wanted to share with you some of our learnings right here in the United States in terms of trying to understand whether the American digital economy uh, worked for everybody. So here we have uh, the governor of West Virginia who uh, is providing incentives to bring uh, remote workers into West Virginia, in particular cities like Morgantown, uh, with incentives like $20,000 to uh, come and work from there. Now, one of the interesting facets of West Virginia is that it is among the least digitally ready states in the United States. And here is a mapping of how 
the digital readiness of West Virginia varies depending on where you live in West Virginia. Those red spots are places where internet connectivity is extremely poor. And even the green spots, the, the height of those uh, that map represents populations clusters. And even the green spots, uh, the uh, uh, internet connectivity isn't great. In fact, uh, among the urban population in West, uh, West Virginia, 62% uh, of the population does not use the internet at high speeds. So even though the governor is offering incentives for remote workers to come and relocate in the state, the connectivity across West Virginia, both rural and urban, is extremely uneven. Now, where are people moving from? A lot of people are moving away from uh, the hubs uh, in uh, places like Boston and uh, San Francisco, the Bay Area. Now, here is how the unevenness of digital access plays out even in a state like California, which does have lots of red spots uh, where internet connectivity isn't great. And even in a city like San Francisco, it isn't as great as one would have thought it to be, given that San Francisco is the capital or the San Francisco area is the capital of the digital economy worldwide. About 38% of uh, urban San Franciscans or urban Californians are not using the internet at uh, high speeds. And finally, I'll close with the, uh, a, a picture of the young 17 year old young woman uh, who uh, took that video of George Floyd standing on a street corner of Southern uh, South Minneapolis, uh, which uh, in many ways uh, uh, made history, uh, made history this, uh, this, this past year. And uh, she was standing on a street corner uh, right here in, uh, in uh, Minnesota. And you can see uh, from our analysis of broadband usage, smartphone usage, the density of uh, uh, different, uh, 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 racial groups uh, in in that in that region. Uh, this is a part of Minnesota that is uh, on, not very well connected uh, in terms of uh, internet connectivity. In fact, smartphone only usage is very high in this part of the state. And yet, it was this uh, place where a smartphone literally changed the course of history. The use of a smartphone on a street corner change the course of history. So digital connectivity and the unevenness of digital connectivity is something that we uh, uh, all want to pay attention to. And it turns out that as we look at different uh, ways uh, to understand the digital divide, whether it's differences in terms of infrastructure, differences in terms of institutional factors, laws and regulations, uh, differences in terms of inclusive and affordable access, or differences in terms of digital proficiency of Americans across the country, uh, there are wide variations. Um, infrastructure, uh, green is good, uh, red or yellow is not so good. You can see how spotty it is. Uh, same for institutions, spotty across the United States. Inclusion and affordability, spotty across the United States. Even digital proficiency, how well uh, 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 sophisticated are we in terms of interpreting all that information that's coming down the pipes? We are quite spotty as you go across the United States. Now, what will it take to fix this? President Biden in his uh, $2 trillion infrastructure plan has put away $100 billion, $100 billion uh, to fix the problem. We make the argument in our research uh, that this uh, $100 billion plan is not ambitious enough. And at the same time, it is too ambitious. Why is it not ambitious enough? That's because the government is uh, its plan is based on a discount or an undercount of the number of people who are internet uh, disconnected. The government believes that about 14 million people are not connected uh, to the internet at high speeds. It turns out that at least 42 million people are not connected to the internet at high speeds. And roughly half the country are not using the internet at high speeds for all kinds of other reasons. And the government's plan is overly ambitious because uh, the idea is to use municipal networks, public networks uh, to close the gap. However, in 18 states, including the state of Pennsylvania, which has lots of red zones, uh, it is against the law uh, to have a municipal uh, network. Legislation prevents uh, public networks from uh, uh, taking hold there. So 
we uh, have a solution for President Biden coming out of our research. Raise the budget. The budget needs to be at least $240 billion to close the digital divide. And where is that money going to come from? Uh, we suggest that that money can uh, be derived by putting a 15% tax on digital ad revenues that the big uh, tech companies are, are earning and have earned uh, over the course of the past several years. In fact, this past year, uh, the tech companies have earned $120 billion in digital ad revenue. So it could be used to uh, create a universal broadband fund from which uh, we could uh, build out this infrastructure. You can also co-opt the big tech companies to offer their access infrastructure at affordable prices, and you can orchestrate public and private partnerships uh, in order to uh, close the gaps across the country. So this work is enormously relevant in not only identifying patterns of digital asymmetries across the world, uh, it's enormously relevant in identifying digital asymmetries uh, right here in the United States. We hope that this pattern recognition is helpful to you. It certainly was helpful to us as we looked across uh, the world and the state of our digital economies. We also hope it's helpful to decision makers as they take action to make the digital economy work for all. Thank you. And for our final update, we'll hear from Katrina Burgess, Associate Professor of Political Economy and Director of the Henry J. Lair Institute. Hello. My name is Katrina Burgess. I'm director of the Lear Institute at the Fletcher School. And I'm just going to share a couple of highlights um, from what we were up to this year, um, particularly in the, in the current context of a global pandemic and some of the struggles for racial justice that we've seen around the world. I'm going to start with just a brief description of some of our flagship programs, which we are continuing to run. Um, one of them is the Corruption, Justice and Legitimacy Program. Um, locally known as CJL, which is directed by Professor Cheyenne Church and Deanna Chigas. Um, and this is a program that's, that's aimed at understanding the relationship between social norms, corruption, and state fragility. Um, and it's been a very active program, um, most notably sort of with a blog, with a number of other deliverables, such as policy briefings, um, and very active on, on social media. Our other flagship program, is the Journeys Project, which is directed by Professor Kim Wilson. Um, and it looks at the journeys of migrants and refugees in several different parts of the world and has really been developing very rich multimedia content to follow these journeys, to, to describe them, to analyze them. Um, and that project is also ongoing and very active. What I'd like to talk about in the rest of, of the time I have today um, is to highlight two series, speaker series that, that we initiated, initiated last summer in the current context in which we're living. And so I won't touch on everything we've done at the Lear Institute, but I wanted to highlight these two projects because I thought they were particularly important given the times that we're living in. Um, and one of these was a speaker series that we called Racial Justice as Human Security, Voices from the Trenches. And the idea here was to bring the issues of racial justice into the Lear Institute, to engage with them, um, because clearly this is a very current topic um, and it's very much related to human security, um, but also I think what the struggles in the United States should become part of what we do at the Fletcher School and more specifically at Lear um, if we are to have a truly global perspective. The two speakers that we invited to speak with us were Ricardo Fernandez, who's an activist, an Afro-Brazilian activist in one of the favelas in Rio de Janeiro, and Suraj Yengde, who has become a very well-known public intellectual um, uh, um, from India, who's a Dalit scholar and activist, and he shared with us his perspective on comparing the caste system in India and the United States. We also had a, uh, I would argue, a related event, which was a, we invited a, a, a well-known much decorated uh, photojournalist, Tomas Ayuso, who's from Honduras, to share and narrate his wonderful collection of photographs of um, migrants, but also the communities from which they come in Honduras and the struggles that they're facing. Um, and he narrated this as a kind of film experience 
um, with with our with our audiences. The other series that we I want to highlight that we organized what we called intersecting pandemics, detention and work in times of COVID. We've obviously all been living in through the, the this global pandemic this year, um, and we wanted to highlight particularly the impact of the pandemic on, on the, the, some of the most marginalized populations um, and, and to actually bring their voices into the conversation, similarly to what we did in the other series. So we had three events um, for in this series, one with a physician, um, a practicing phys emergency room physician who works with a lot of incarcerated people, um, and then two events where we had um, people who had experienced these issues from the perspective of either being an incarcerated person or being an essential worker and sharing their perspectives and their experiences and their struggles with, with, our, with our audiences at Lear. Um, and, and I think it was fairly unusual that we were bringing the voices of the, the marginalized people themselves rather than people talking about them. And I thought that was particularly important in this particular juncture in which we've all been living. And then a related event, that we held with one of our senior policy fellows, um, Daryl Collins, was a, a brown bag lunch where she discussed some of the innovative data collection strategies that she's been developing in the context of the pandemic, um, particularly using digital technologies um, in order to do research remotely. Um, and these technologies could be extremely useful and helpful beyond the pandemic, but were particularly salient during this period where we couldn't do field work research and it was difficult to reach people. So I think I'll stop there. We did a lot of other things at Lear, but I think these were kind of the highlights of, of this year um, and very much shaped by the, the, the experiences that, that, that we were living through both here in the United States, in Medford, but also globally. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Burgess. This is just a small sample of the work we've done this year. And with more students returning to campus in the fall, I'm confident that all of our research centers will continue to make vital strides in their research. Our work isn't done in a vacuum. The involvement of members of the extended Fletcher community, alumni, donors, parents, and friends is key and precisely what makes this kind of work so rewarding. One title I didn't mention in the introduction is that I'm also a proud alumna of the Fletcher School. I hope you're enjoying Alumni Weekend and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks for watching and please keep in touch.